Hello and welcome to ET Energy World. I am Sudhir, editor ET Energy World, and this is our special webinar on Budget 2020, the expectations from the power and renewable energy sectors. The speaker for this webinar is Kameshwar Rao. He's the leader of energy utilities and mining at PwC India. In this webinar, Kameshwar will discuss the fine print of the budget expectations for these sectors, and that will be followed by a Q&A session with the audience. You can type in your questions in the chat box or the control panel. Over to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Sudhir, uh, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to the webinar, uh, Budget 2020 Expectations for the Power and Renewable Energy Sectors. Uh, the sector, of course, uh, as we know, is in a very strong position today and uh, well placed to meet not just the emerging demand from the current and new consumers, but interestingly also has uh, made a very good transition uh, to clean energy. Uh, of course, it is not without challenges, uh, and that brings also a lot of opportunities, which are now shaped with changes that we see in terms of industry structure, technology, uh, and private participation, of course. So what I would really like to do in this uh, webinar is to cover some of these things uh, and of course, uh, it's a very, very in, uh, evolving uh, and dynamic subject, uh, and we will wait to, and see what happens in the weeks to come. Those are the things that I will try to touch upon. Uh, what's really the uh, changes in the very recent times, what we expect to see in the year 2020. Uh, there is a case to be made for a number of uh, reforms in uh, in the sector uh, and as I said uh, how technology is really shaping the future uh, of the sector. Uh, let's then dive into uh, how the year evolved. One of the key features of course is uh, how impactful the spread of electrification uh, has been uh, for the economy and that will continue to evolve as, it, as we see uh, in the coming uh, years. Uh, to start with, of course, the huge increase in customer base uh, is a very significant uh, aspect of it with, with universal access. Uh, fortunately, the capacity addition that took place before that uh, did mean that we not only absorbed the new set of consumers, uh, but also the deficits got reduced uh, from 9%, 3.6% to barely about 04 now. Uh, it's a great sign. Uh, and notwithstanding this small uh, slump that we see in demand and much talked about, uh, the long-term fundamentals are really good. Uh, we do expect demand uh, to continue to grow strongly on account of uh, urbanization. Urban areas are very energy intensive on account of transportation, which is getting electrified with the railways, metros, uh, and personal transport. And more interestingly, the penetration of appliances. Now the customer base, which has increased, the penetration is uh, trickling in and that will translate into uh, demand as we go along. Uh, in short, uh, what I believe is the sector is not just likely to grow in scale, uh, but a lot more in complexity. And now why that is uh, in a few slides from now. As I said, the generation capacity itself has uh, kept pace uh, with uh, demand. Uh, if you look at uh, peak demand growth of uh, about 2.6% in the last few years, five years, uh, generation capacity expanded almost 7% plus, uh, and even excluding uh, renewable energy, if you look at pure dispatchable, close to 5%. Uh, the significant shift, as I mentioned, of course, is towards the non-fossil fuel capacity. It's close to 37% now, uh, and it's very close to our commitments on climate change agenda. Interestingly, what's also happening is a, replace, is a replacement of uh, a whole fleet, uh, 250 megawatt and smaller and about 25 years old uh, machines is at almost 35 gigawatts of capacity, which will need to get replaced before long. Now, we have a choice here, of course, in which direction and in what form uh, this shift uh, takes place. Now, if you look at the thermal capacity itself, as I said, uh, the new build has tapered off uh, in the recent years. 
partly on account of uh, policy, which is in, in to shift to clean energy, uh, equally in terms of allocation of uh, natural resources. So we are at this point in time where uh, there is a significant underutilized capacity, even though the demand uh, growth continues. Uh, what it means is uh, the PLFs, which are today low at 56%, uh, do provide a bit of a respite uh, for demand growth as well as retirements. But the fundamental issue here is the base load capacity uh, requirement still remains. And where would that come from? If you look at the projects in pipeline, the vast majority of them, about four fifths, are with state GENCOs, and they have serious funding constraints besides other issues of uh, development time, etc. Now, what could be a game changer going forward uh, is opening up uh, commercial coal mining, and that, along with open access, could see revival of significant investments from large energy users. And that's on the conventional side. If you look at the non-fossil fuel generation, as I mentioned, uh, there is an increase in capacity, but if you look at the actual generation that has gone up in the year from about 21.5% to 24, uh, of course, held by a very good year of hydro, uh, but nonetheless. Now, what this means that this kind of seasonal and, of course, variable production uh, in this year, for example, is about 25% uh, or higher for five months a year. That's a very, very high penetration uh, uh, for, a, for a network of our size. And this poses new challenges. It poses new costs for state utilities who will ultimately have to bear all the upstream costs of imbalance uh, of unutilized capacity uh, and indeed of uh, managing higher costs of that integration. What is taking place though is solving this uh, in terms of looking at uh, wind solar hybrids which might optimize a bit of resources, including transmission, uh, storage, or dispatchable RE supply. Now, these are the new uh, procurement plans that have come up, which aim to moderate a bit of this risk and maybe contain the cost. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a significant issue that we need to manage and deal with. And I'll come back to it in a few slides from now. At the start, of course, uh, is uh, how this is managed in the present state. Uh, we'll see what uh, needs to be done going forward. Uh, the changes in terms of uh, a wide variety of things. Uh, on one hand, demand movement, uh, and on the other hand, uh, frequency and a number of other events in between, uh, outages, uh, weather events, and so on and so forth, uh, are all managed today uh, by the regulation service. Now, if you just look at uh, the, the interesting shift in the current year 2019 uh, is uh, given the somewhat uh, soft demand uh, and strong availability, uh, we've had very little of upregulation required. In fact, uh, dipping from 0.34 to 0.2%, uh, whereas just the opposite for down regulation, uh, it's gone up from 0.2 to 0.29. Uh, and of course, there's the cost uh, up there, uh, which, it, which it requires to manage this. What it effectively uh, trying to say here is the cost uh, that we have to incur in managing this uh, variability, besides, of course, the other uh, weather and other conditions which get included in this aspect of it. Uh, let's move on and look at where all these then costs eventually sit in distribution. Now, while over the uh, recent uh, years, we've seen some improvement in operating losses uh, and of course, financial losses, uh, as you see that dipped. Uh, but in the last few quarters, we have seen a worsening of the situation. So both operating losses and financial losses going up. Now, this is quite besides the delayed payments, uh, which themselves may mask uh, considerable other financial losses of that. It's not for lack of initiatives. A number of new actions have been taken, taken, but I think what we lack is really in scale uh, and in proper adoption of that. Now, whether this is for addressing revenue leakages through a variety of measures, uh, private participation through whether uh, licensee mode or franchisee or even outsourcing of specific services, 
and uh, various sets of demand side management measures. Uh, for example, the solar rooftops were number of subsidized consumers, agriculture pumps, and so on and so forth. Uh, payment security, enforcing contracts, and more recently, smart metering and digitization. Now, with all these, as I said, uh, there is a suboptimal scale and uh, inadequate adoption from the utilities, which is really uh, causing the gains to be lost. Now, this has resulted uh in delayed payments uh there's a very substantive amount uh, which is today overdue uh to various generators and uh, while of course what the graphic uh, doesn't fully show here is that the number of reporting uh, entities has gone up so we should uh, keep that in mind uh, but nonetheless if you look at the amounts which are overdue to an average monthly billing uh, for conventional energy, it has gone up from about three and a half times to about five and a half times. Uh, that's that's the kind of uh, overdues which are present in the system. Much worse for renewables at eight months the billing, eight times the billing monthly billing. So uh, the outstandings here today are about uh, sorry the overdues are about uh, five and a half times and eight times or eight months of the average monthly billing now uh, this is a very substantive cost on those entities uh, and that uh, needs to be really uh, addressed uh, let's look at some of the reasons uh, for this and that's uh, let me step into a, a discussion this section on uh, what are the challenges uh, but equally what the opportunities are so as i said let's uh, look at a, a bit more closely on the issue of outstanding dues and as you can see here, a common reason, of course, is a delay in the government subsidy. Uh, a number of uh, states uh, have a delayed subsidy almost to the order of magnitude of 25-30% of the revenue, which is very, very substantive. Uh, and that creates a huge amount of cash crunch uh, in the system. Nonetheless, there are other issues too, which can be more uh, better addressed. Uh, one reason is delay in regulatory decisions, uh, especially that of true up of increase in power purchase costs, uh, and many cases non applicability of the fuel cost adjustments and so on. Uh, equally, there have been operational issues, uh, decline in collection, very surprisingly in states that had had a reasonably good track record, uh, and uh, and even um, capex funding getting funded through current liabilities and so on. Uh, all these reasons. Uh, create uh, the delayed uh, payments uh, to generators and that's re really behind uh, the current challenges they face today. If this is the case, uh, how does investment in the sector really look? And here we're looking at essentially uh, the renewable energy bits, uh, all of them that have been tendered during the year. Uh, very, as, as you can see from the graphic, uh, which is the tender capacity that was uh, attended and what got awarded finally. Clearly, they struggled to get good participation. Uh, about 40% of the renewable energy bids went undersubscribed. In fact, the prior participation itself has come down to about five uh, bidders on average. Now, this is up, you know, down from uh, an average of 25, 30, and even higher in the previous years. The number of hurdles, uh, not just one, uh, tariff caps were a concern earlier, but now increasingly there are many other factors. It could be uncertainty on uh, contracting the PPAs uh, in some states, restrictions on conversion of land, uh, transmission, of course, uh, because uh, substations with available capacity are fewer, and then the choice becomes uh, looking for a location around them. And with challenges in the financial sector, both funding and in the electricity sector on cash constraints, uh, also do not do a favor. So the number of these uh, issues that are really holding back a more robust participation, which has also means that the competition is not that strong. So given this scenario, uh, how does uh, the opportunity going ahead look? 
uh, it still is fairly positive uh, in terms of a long-term outlook. Uh, in fact, uh, new energy investments are strongly needed for growth, for economic security, and in fact, even for uh, climate change commitments. Uh, if you just look at the per capita consumption today, even to get to a vision 2025, it needs a 37% growth. And to get to anywhere near middle-income nations, about 74%. So there is a significant um, catch-up that needs to be done. As a result, uh, the investment that is proposed in energy is almost a quarter of all infrastructure. That's a very substantive outlay that's, that's been proposed. Uh, this is equally uh, across conventional, uh, where state and central utilities dominate, and renewables, where largely it's private. Uh, of course, there's also investment into various transmission and other projects as well. So a quarter of all investments, infrastructure investments expected in the sector. So that's a very strong statement of the potential opportunity that, that exists. Uh, a particular aspect here is to also look, uh, look at uh, not just the domestic, but uh, the export or import market. Uh, there's a key reason to do this. It is to improve the diversity of our supply sources, and importantly, to reduce cost, carbon intensity, and so on. A number of uh, strong factors are in uh, favor of this. Uh, large hydro potential in the region, which we need uh, to meet our commitments, uh, trilateral trade, and potential sourcing from different options, whether it's exchange, traders, regional exchange, and so on and so forth. And all of that built on a very strong set of existing trade arrangements. So that makes it uh, far more secure uh, than otherwise. One other element that might see, uh, that, that will see significant action is on sourcing coal. So uh, the domestic supply has largely fed uh, demand so far. And in the recent years, if you, uh, the, 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 demand, the, the local uh, supply itself, uh, about five and a half percent, uh, easily meeting uh, uh, the demand and imports were required only for a small proportion. Uh, in fact, in the last year, in the in the last year, it's been uh, it's dipped from 21 to 19 percent. So we did not need that much, especially with the captive blocks picking up. Now, I think fundamentally, what could be a game changer here is uh, the policy support that local sourcing is getting. And in particular, with now commercial mining with no end user restrictions, uh, this could be a significant uh, prospect. Indeed, if you look at the blocks that have been put up, uh, a large proportion of them, about 70% of them, uh, have, are explored. Uh, a number of them, about 15 blocks, uh, have reserves where you could easily set up a 4 gigawatt UMPP. So that brings a huge proportion of uh, our reserves uh, to the market uh, to be able to set up on a competitive basis. And that's a potential investment opportunity as well. So with these uh, things, uh, what do we believe the immediate future holds? And that's what I'll cover in the next section on what are the expectations and what reforms that we will need. A key thing, of course, uh, is to deal with the financial performance. Uh, and then the graphic on the top uh, right. Uh, if you look at about 17 utilities uh, have uh, revenue requirements which are less than the costs, in other words, loss making. Even those 10, we have to really look at it closely because of the nature of delayed payments. That could really represent uh, uh, recoveries which may not come in their favor. In other words, if the regulator disallows those costs uh, to that extent, it will become losses and those payments will have to be made from elsewhere. Uh, so even these 10, we will take with a pinch of salt. Now, where private participation has been introduced, such as with uh, franchises, licenses, and so on, uh, there's been a significant uh, gain, uh, not just in terms of operations, but also service gains and benefits uh, in, 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 to, to, to investment and so on. Uh, of course, there have been some failures, but if you look at the operating performance of various franchises on the bottom right, uh, there have been uh, very, very substantive recoveries 
uh, from not just losses but also past payments and so on and so forth. So what we believe to that we might see uh, in the budget or uh, immediate subsequent discussions is a performance-based financial support for turnaround. Now we uh, we have had uh, Uday earlier, uh, but utilities who were expected to take advantage of that uh, to put in measures to reduce losses, reduce cost of production, uh, I believe may have missed the bus. Uh, and as a result, we saw earlier that the recoveries were uh, going down. Uh, what I believe would take place now is a more uh, a guaranteed or a performance-based uh, financial support, which would be granted only on achievement of those specific targets. Uh, what I also expect is specific measures to reduce the cost of uh, production or development risk. This could be in terms of investment in supply chain, the ports, railways, etc., or funding for infrastructure, uh, such as for uh, the solar park, uh, renewable energies, uh, transmission investments, and so on, and maybe reduction of certain tax rates that's been already talked about. We could also see large-scale public procurement, which is the government committing to an auction pipeline, whether it's for renewables or transmission, and of course, for commercial coal as well. Uh, we have to see with further reforms in unbundling where that would take us. Beyond that, there are also regulatory and tariff reforms. Uh, we struggle still to get uh, cost reflective tariffs. And in fact, uh, there is been a lot, there's been a bit of lost ground here in the last few years. If you look at the graphic on top right here on the tariff revisions in the last five years, most utilities, the majority of them have revised rates which are either zero to 2%, two to 4%, and so on. Very few uh, have really reflected inflation or other costs that they naturally carry. So for most, in most cases, it's been below inflation and hence, unless there have been substantive uh, performance improvements, which we do not see uh, in the financials, then this only adds to the burden. What we then expect is a stronger policy push uh, in terms of immediate policy to look at more cost reflective tariffs and perhaps to move more uh, credible steps to move subsidy to a DBT platform. Uh, likewise, on retail competition uh, and captives, uh, we, we do know that, of course, uh, uh, direct supply can be uh, more cost effective because uh, of the cross subsidy surcharge, but it's not just about that. Uh, the number of non-tariff barriers, the caps on capacity that you can actually set up in certain states uh, or the process, uh, and of course, if it is captive, then the erosion of the banking provisions over the years. Now, what this has really meant is uh, even if a uh, large energy user is looking to either for uh, brand reasons, or for cost reasons, uh, switch suppliers, they're really not at liberty to do so. So there is no real competition in that sense. And what we expect is hopefully the policy to start uh, promotion uh, of competition in a more active way to reduce the cost to the industry. Uh, on a broader basis, perhaps uh, we, we could see more uh, starting from the approach paper uh, that uh, we should move from current addiction to a long-term PPA, which is causing a huge amount of cost burden, especially when, when the plants are not fully utilized, to a more pooled procurement uh, so that it enables more efficient dispatch and then consequently for everybody, lower costs. So those are a few things uh, that uh, on the regulatory side, uh, I expect to see. Uh, moving on, uh, we did see, of course, uh, uh, strong announcements uh, on hydro, uh, which, uh, as the graphic shows, uh, there's a huge amount of untapped capacity. Uh, the tapped capacity is fairly small. Uh, and to promote that, uh, of course, co-opting this uh, as renewable energy, uh, not just below 25 megawatts, but the entire amount, large hydro including, uh, purchase obligations, and funding of infrastructure costs, such as for the roads, access roads, and so on, 
ex the tariff life, of course, extended now uh, to 40, uh, and then uh, sorry, the useful life extended to 40, and then the tariff flexibility granted for these. Uh, we need to see uh, some of those detailing to come out, and that's what we expect uh, to see going forward. In particular, to also see uh, specifics being talked about on pump storage. Uh, if you look at networks uh, uh, that are developed similar to us, uh, larger than us, the much larger amount of uh, pump storage in their systems, especially helps them in making the switch to uh, renewable energy and that's something that we expect uh, will get a more active uh, investment or policy support uh, in the budget. Uh, there could be more uh, but these are the salient ones that I believe uh, that we could be uh, seeing uh, in or around this time frame. Now what I wanted to also touch upon is while uh, many of them uh, the time has come uh, and, and, and have been a part of the industry for some time. Uh, this is also getting pushed with more and more technology adoption. And a couple of things uh, on that uh, could be of interest. Uh, one is, of course, on renewable integration. And uh, while the initial days of uh, promotion have served us really well, uh, we are now facing the challenge where there's a significant mismatch uh, in the load and generation, and that is causing in uh, significant cost impact uh, at the state utility level, whether it's in terms of uh, ramping, the spend on um, uh, oil and uh, an ancillaries, uh, as well as, of course, on the frequency overloading, voltage drop, and so on. So a number of factors getting impacted, uh, and each of that has a cost. Now, here the graphic on the top shows uh, a particular day in the southern region and uh, the vertical lines uh, are generation from solar and wind which as you can see exceeds the demand at particular points of this day midday uh, what it means really is the entire region was fed by renewables and a bit more was left out as a result the graphic below uh, is the action taken on other generators largely conventional uh, to ramp down and quickly ramp up uh, with a bit of export uh, in between that became necessary. Now, this is a very significant cost to the system uh, and, of course, creates pressures. Uh, what we need is a bit of policy and technical solutions going forward, including introduction of new balancing service providers. A number of countries do that on a commercial basis, uh, while we have done it on an administrative basis. Uh, this increasingly becomes necessary because active investment needs to be created uh, in or, or, or uh, projects restructured to provide this particular service such as your gas plants and so on uh, and and that needs to be uh, uh, that needs to be shaped by a regulation or a policy uh, likewise uh, on ancillary services uh, further deepening as well as peak shifting and transmission capacity enhancement uh, are all needed. And we expect that that also would be a case of uh, a policy drive. Uh, going further, looking at a number of technology initiatives, both at the utility side and the customer side, uh, which are going on. And uh, they also will be very interested to see the implications for themselves in terms of overall market, uh, and opportunity as well as the cost uh, that gets levied on to them. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the ongoing digitization process of uh, for the utilities in terms of core business operations. And we see that in, in terms of dashboards, mobility products um, on the ERPs and so on. But further investment into um, operating technologies. Now, this is for asset management to look at optimizing those assets or to even get a real-time uh, view of the health uh, of loading, et cetera, and then to undertake preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance, and maintain a higher quality of supply. It's also being uh, actively tapped in on capital projects, uh, especially on transmission to look at, to, to help with uh, time and cost delivery, uh, but as much as in safety and compliance aspects as well. On smart meters, while the pilot projects move on into a more rollout mode, we then need to also see how 
that gets tapped into data analytics and actual actions at the utility level. So this is again a work in progress that that needs to be uh, driven to the completion. Uh, cybersecurity we know uh, has uh, reared its herd, head uh, on a few occasions and it's a threat to SCADA and industrial control systems uh, and then utilities again uh, looking at how do they address this. In a few cases uh, there's a approach to regulators uh, by power companies also to provide for a sandbox uh, to undertake some new initiatives, uh, regulatory initiatives. Uh, or customer side uh, that could potentially provide a significant upside for them and meet very niche customer needs. Uh, equally, we see on the uh, customer side a number of uh, initiatives leveraging technology, for example, large energy users uh, analyzing their use to meet uh, or uh, the norms, but equally to look at uh, how do they manage better the captive assets uh, such as their solar and wind projects, as well as the uh, internal loads, for example, on lighting, uh, and more recently to look at uh, mobility services within the campus. Uh, the others, of course, in terms of appliances uh, and uh, pumps and community projects that have already been initiated. Uh, the institutions in this space uh, are interestingly scaling up uh, and becoming very uh, more bold and dominant. This could be in terms of aggregators and escos. Uh, the behind the meter solutions uh, somewhat nascent, uh, but there's an active uh, discussion from large energy, energy users to look at uh, how do we use this to manage their peak and, sto and, and leverage storage to reduce uh, the peak and the TOD costs. Uh, that they suffer as much from the regulators too to look at uh, if these investments are made then indeed there could be a saving on the network cost and hence then in terms of uh, charges that get levied to consumers uh, so it also helps in reducing or avoiding expansion of the network altogether uh, and then there are a few uh, new business models which are largely aimed at a uh, customer response or aggregation uh, they are also being uh, attempted in a number of states so these are some of the technology adoption uh, at both utility and uh, customer side that that's going on and we spoke about at the grid side as well uh, in fact uh, that's uh, what i have uh, in this uh, presentation uh, covering both uh, the year 2019 the key challenges and opportunities that i think uh, we will have an opportunity immediately in the current year and what we expect in terms of uh, policy reforms and uh, budget initiatives to come through. So uh, I'd be happy Sudhir then to take on any questions or any clarifications uh, that anyone might need. Okay, uh, thank you, Kamishwar, uh, for that uh, really insightful uh, session. And you've talked about a lot of important things. You've covered the entire gamut of the power and uh, renewable energy sectors. Uh, and uh, there's a long list of questions that we have got, uh, and a lot of them are really interesting. So uh, let's begin with uh, a question from uh, Sudha Mahalingam. She's asking, the must-run status of RE has resulted in uh, Southern Discoms running massive losses because they are backing down efficient thermal stations to accommodate RE. Now, how do we resolve this? All right. So, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. And uh, I, I'm sure uh, it, there are a lot of folks uh, who feel pretty deeply about this uh, because uh, it's, it, I mean, it's a renewable rich area and clearly the penetration has taken off. In fact, if you look at uh, at a monthly uh, level, uh, it's as uh, high as 50, 60 percent. And indeed, on this particular day, uh, I think it is 26 December. As I said, uh, the entire region is met by purely renewable alone, even if it is for a few time blocks. So yes, that's an issue, and that's also reflected, uh, as you said, uh, in a number of uh, costs, uh, which could be idle plants. Uh, the cost of ramp up ramp down in terms of heating uh, of course uh, stress uh, on on the equipment and so on and so forth 
uh, I think what we lead, what we need severely to go forward is really a load following uh, capacity. Today, either we have a base load uh, uh, conventional uh, power generators or we have renewables. We really do not have much of in the region uh, load following capacity. A lot of hydro happens to be associated with uh, flood control, irrigation, and then electricity. So we really don't get much of a uh, leverage there uh, and there's been very limited pump storage investment so long and short to answer the question it's a very serious uh, issue and and this challenge for the utilities is reflecting in other things I mean it's simply higher cost uh, delayed payments and indeed even cancel contracts all that is 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 a is symptomatic of a deeper issue which is what I believe this is uh, we do need, as I said, uh, load following generation capacity here uh, in terms of uh, either balancing service providers to come up uh, and we could uh, tap into both private sector as well as trust assets to provide this, not just relying on the current reserve and ancillary services, uh, which are probably not adequate to meet this on a cost efficient basis. There is also effort on the customer side, whether we can shift some of the peak but I don't think that is in the current at least uh, uh, conditions that that is seeming to be an issue. It's simply the seasonal and variable generation. I hope that helps. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the next uh, question is from um, Kishan Mundra, who is asking, it's a very simple question. Um, any expectations on um, subsidy for gas-based power plants? Now, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure the reference here is to the budget. And uh, I remember reading recently how, you know, there was, a, there was an article saying that the government may be looking at some kind of a kind of a scheme for uh, revival of gas-based power plants. Please share your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that has always been a challenge, even in the past when we did have that uh, provision of subsidy. Uh, a, everyone took a haircut. Uh, and B, it was for a very limited period of time. So uh, I, I'm sure uh, the person who asked is really looking for a long-term sustainable uh, solution uh, than a six-month uh, subsidy support, uh, even if that much is equally welcome. Uh, I mean, as I said, uh, we do need, we, we have an opportunity to put the fleet to good use. Uh, it may be caught up in a uh, in a web of past contracts and so on, uh, and of course uh, costs associated with that. Uh, so I I do imagine that it is not a easy thing for someone to solve it, uh, but there is an opportunity to tap that into uh, a, a load following capa I mean generating capacity. Uh, it will be very difficult to see a government taking a very long term view to provide continued subsidy. If anything, we will probably be, we have seen that it has been weaned off uh, subsidies than to, uh, and, and SOPs than to give any more. So my best hope would be uh, to see that it, it gets restructured in a different format. Uh, if not, then there may be just a very short term subsidy, but I don't think that's very guaranteed. Okay, um, so there are two uh, very related questions on storage uh, from Dev Malya Sain and Ashish Basu. Uh, so uh, Dev Malya is asking, what are your thoughts on energy storage aspect? And the other question is, is anything expected in this budget pertaining to uh, battery storage uh, as now the focus is uh, shifting towards balancing mechanism? So overall, your, your thoughts on energy storage and battery storage and what can the government do to, uh, you know, uh, give a boost for uh, manufacturing capacities there as far as this budget is concerned. Right. Uh, it is very, very topical and uh, we do, we are hoping that there would be initiatives uh, across the technologies. Uh, we have uh, we kind of slip some, miss some time on this because as I said, uh, other networks of similar size have much larger storage capacity available to them, uh, which does uh, address not just the variability, seasonality, but also help with uh, peak management and so on. Uh, we have very limited in even where it is established, even the four and a half gigawatts that we do have, uh, only a small part of that is effective for various technical reasons. Um, 
so 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 uh, the, the situation is actually far worse than uh, what we have now what we need for a network of our size is really vast grid uh, scale uh, storage uh, so it may not be eventually one technology that that may come to um, rescue here uh, but a wide variety of them i think a part of it the government has already initiated actions which i mentioned which is why i picked up hydro in specific uh, to say that uh, the revival is not unrelated to this uh, is to look at uh, how that can help uh, with better funding and uh, better terms the tariff terms and revive many of the stalled projects uh, because many of them these are all large storage based projects giving some part of the capability so some part of the capability may come from mainstream hydro uh, second which i called out specifically on pump storage because uh, that is eminently um, locally made uh, and can be ramped up uh, with current capabilities so i believe that may get uh, some more support uh, as far as the chemical storage is concerned then we need to see uh, which direction because today a number of technologies are actually vying for each other uh, and the economic case is somewhat down the road so i would be really uh, uh, a challenge to put a position there to say this is exactly what they will do. I think the long and short, they're very exercised on, on the matter of investing into storage. Uh, the, the, the traditional parts of it are well known and will get invested in. Uh, the, the more recent uh, technologies, we need to wait and see how what position the government takes. Okay, uh, there's a question from Rasika, uh, who is asking, in the absence of wholesale and retail time of day price signals, what can the policymakers or regulators or discoms uh, do to encourage demand side flexibility or participation? Is the sector ready for more nuanced TOD time of day or complete dynamic pricing for all categories of consumers, including residential? Well, I mean, that's, that's a a uh, very big question, I think, uh, <laughs> to answer. Uh, but, but you're right. I mean, it, 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 the, the time has really come to push for that. Uh, and, and we've kind of uh, caught in a, uh, a challenge of our own making because uh, a, a lot of, uh, I mean, the, the large energy users at least uh, should be very amenable to this. Uh, but the kind of sourcing that they have from the exchange, from uh, uh, from third party owned sources uh, has actually dwindled in the last few years, uh, last three years, uh, due to a whole lot of non-tariff barriers as well as cost arbitrage that's left out to them. Uh, so in fact, it's it's uh, become slightly uh, less uh, optimistic than it, than it was two years back in terms of uh, looking at uh, time of the day. What stage? It's have done though on a more administrative basis is to create more slots, uh, create, uh, I mean, or expand the hours in which uh, the differential pricing is applied. That doesn't help it too much though. Uh, what you need really, and as I said, in the regulatory reforms part of it uh, is a uh, to, to drive that more in terms of at least for the large and commercial energy users to be reflective. And today it should be possible with, as we talk about the smart metering rollout as well, uh, because A, you have the analytics uh, and B, then that can be immediately reflected uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, billing and the scheduling, uh, sorry, accounting as well. Uh, so that's one part of it. The larger issue, as I mentioned, is uh, unless we are shifting ourselves into uh, a more longer term, of, uh, I mean, a longer term view to from a PPA to a more uh, flexible pool uh, procurement or to a market mechanism, it will be difficult to uh, translate that fully because for us, the large energy users uh, who can respond to it uh, are not actually that, that large a proportion. Uh, the rest of us, whether we can move uh, the demand so much in response to their pricing, or it will be simply paying for a higher cost for which the solution should be actually to have a different mix of generation is a slightly you know a more deeper question we need to see so if if the users if those users cannot respond then we should be looking at our generation mix 
uh, and not uh, expecting us to respond to those prices. Uh, so that's what I would leave it at this stage, uh, Sudhir. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so the next question is from Urvisha. Uh, uh, and, you know, this is one question I also wanted to ask you. Uh, do we foresee budget expectations uh, towards the power and uh, renewable energy sectors to be uh, in line with the NIP, the National Infrastructure Pipeline? Right. And 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 by that you mean that uh, would it would it be uh, supporting those kind of invest scale of investments? Is that what would it be? Is? Would it be supportive of and would it be reflective of both? So so to I mean I would really hope that the part of which which can be controlled uh, certainly should be reflective. And if you look at it uh, in the initial years. Uh, the conventional power, uh, and, and I'm you know looking at uh, refurbishment, transmission, distribution investments um, in this in particular uh, would really happen because you know that's that's where uh, I think we desperately need uh, upgradation. Uh, of course, there is a software institutional aspect also, but but keeping that aside, uh, for sure, whether it's in terms of uh, digitization or network upgradation. Uh, this is very much needed and I hope at least the conventional part of it where uh, the government can control uh, those investments uh, do take place on the private sector which then uh, is on the renewable side uh, which expands actually in the later years uh, the hope is really that uh, we need to, two things there isn't it as we discussed uh, one is the the risks uh, that today uh, uh, to, to, today that we look at, uh, how do we address them? I mean, as I said, if investment attractiveness has so severely dropped that there is under subscription uh, and, and so on and so forth, uh, we need a more uh, harmonized approach to this uh, and, and not just uh, a tinkering around with the tariff cap and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, uh, if I cannot uh, acquire land or my uh, space for uh, looking at a potential uh, uh, location is limited by where I have a transmission availability. Uh, and indeed, more severely, I can't put in equity because I'm not getting paid. All these are serious uh, constraints. So in terms of getting um, a more ease of doing business here, all these things will need to be addressed. And I realize many of them are state level. So I think some level of harmonization may be necessary. The second, of course, is, um, is, is really the auction pipeline because uh, our economies, uh, if, if to, to get to the uh, kind of cost effective prices that we have gotten used to, we need the supply chain to be robust and healthy. Uh, and if the auction pipeline doesn't hold up, as we have seen in the last two years, a lot of the supply chain gets damaged. Uh, companies close down, the suppliers are unable to you know, get the economies of scale because orders are few here and there, um, or there are desperate situations where, you know, they're trying to bid into it, but not able to execute because there is no working capital and so on. Uh, I, I, I'm getting a bit granular here, but long and short is, unless there is a very clear and uh, disciplined uh, auction pipeline, we don't build a supply chain. If we don't, then we don't get the cost economies. Um, so, so those are the two things uh, 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 so to answer. A, on conventional, I hope they do invest because we need that and it's in the government's control. B, on the private side, it's a bit more softer uh, solution needed in terms of uh, uh, ease of doing business and to have a very credible auction pipeline. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, the next question, and uh, I would say uh, this is going to be the last question that we can take given the paucity of time. Uh, and it's an interesting one uh, from Sudha Malingam. She's asking, solar panels have been reported to have much shorter life cycle uh, than the PPAs, let's say seven to eight years. So where does that leave the discoms when the panels degrade? What about the disposal of degraded panels? Are we looking at a huge waste problem? Right. So this is interesting, but I'm afraid this goes uh, beyond my capabilities uh, in a sense, because uh, uh, I mean, we, we, I do have colleagues who do deal with uh, 
uh, post degradation, uh, how they use that. Um, so I will have to actually uh, uh, say, you know, I would not be the best person to answer of how do we use this uh, post uh, the degradation. Uh, but it's really not seven years, so I'm not sure why that number has popped up. Uh, I mean, we do have a number of, I mean, these initiatives are not by uh, individual uh, households or users. Many of these investments are done by RESCOs. Uh, and uh, we do know that they have a very established and secure uh, supply chain testing, etc. Of course, there are smaller firms too who do that, but by and large, it's done by a fairly, uh, that's a very good ecosystem that's developed. And now they're very uh, large scale programs like the recent one that we've had in Madhya Pradesh, which uh, is for schools, uh, hospitals, uh, colleges, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are all large scale programs which enable um, procurement uh, of high rated panels. So I'm not too sure why that number popped up, but on the disposal, I'll have to plead ignorance for now. Okay, um, so the questions are uh, keeping on um, coming, but uh, you know we don't have a lot of time, and we'll have to wrap it up here. Uh, uh, you know, thanks, uh, Kamishwar, for this uh, really insightful session and uh, the perspective you've given us on all of these important topics and the budget-related aspects also. Uh, thanks to listeners also for being a patient audience. Uh, you can of course uh, access uh, the video recording of the session on the webinar page of ET Energy World very soon. Um, and uh, just for information, we'll have the next webinar session on budget expectation for the oil and gas sector on 30th of Jan, which is Thursday, coming Thursday. So uh, that is all from uh, our side, signing off. Uh, uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.